Welcome back to the Mining Pod. What the hell was this week, Matt? This is... Oh my God. There's not really words to describe what we saw this week, uh, honestly. There's a $10 billion hole in the industry right now. And whether you care about mining or just Bitcoin, this story impacts you. What's happening with FTX and San Bankman Freed. Uh, we're going to get into that. I think we're just going to devote the entire show, about 10, 15 minutes, to talking about FTX. There's some exposure to the mining sector, so we will definitely highlight that. But I think it's it's probably better just to hit the highlights, the key talking points, the things that people should know about. Uh, there's some things that happened in the mining sector this week. We saw Marathon Riot publish a Q3 reports. We have that on the Compass Mining website, also on our newsletter, Mining Memo. Very important, but I think this FTX is it's just like a sun exploding. Uh, honestly, there's not much more that's important than it right now. Let's, I mean, let's just get into it. Let's like address the elephant in the room. FTX filed bankruptcy chapter 11 today, uh, at, the, at, the, at the time of recording. Um, and what we know is that they were commingling their clients' funds and lending them out. Like the biggest no no, right? Um, the store, we're, we're going to stick to the highlights, as you mentioned, but I encourage listeners to go out and read this stuff it's super, like i expect a documentary to come out in a few years like it, it's it's so convoluted it's fraudulent it like i from the perspective of like the employees of the company i would be super frustrated and i feel for them greatly um because this is an absolute mess uh let's like let me let me get into it and and try to explain um at least what i understand with the large speculation of what happened here right there is um, a token issued by FTX called FTT. What the speculation is, they issued this asset and they gave it for super cheap or perhaps for free, some sort of pre-mine over to the trading hedge fund arm um, that Sam Bankman Fried, the CEO of FTX, formerly created called Alameda. Right? They gave it to them. Alameda then would take that FTT token Posted as collateral in a loan agreement back to FTX, who would then take their client funds, their customer funds, the deposits on hand from people like us and lend it back for trading purposes. And so you have a situation where Alameda can lever themselves up to oblivion, um, which it seems like they did to at least a, a high extent to a great degree. And then uh, kind of the news that broke uh, about a week ago or so is from, uh, I believe, originally a, a Coindesk article from Right Will, is the financial position of Alameda was not great. Um, the speculation is that it's likely has not been great for a couple months now. And, you know, competitor to FTX, Binance, CZ sort of went public with some, inf with some information um, that he was going to sort of exit their FTT position. They had a large sum from uh, previous uh, investments with two FTX. And so dumping those holdings, the value of FTT starts going down. There's sort of fear in the markets. People panic, sell off. The FTT price continues to go down. That collateral that Alameda posted to the FTX exchange becomes devalued. They essentially just get margin called right at the end of the day. And then you have a very fractional reserve situation at the exchange. And the result, as we know now, was basically a bank run. Um, if you look at the figures and the charts across the industry, the sort of assets on FTX, their ETH balance, the stablecoin balance, the Bitcoin balance, sort of tanked down as everyone rushed to a straw. There were freezes. Am I missing anything? Will, will pop in help me out? Is that, is that pretty much what, what you see as well? Let's go to these tweets for a, a better summary. This is from right. Chainlinkgod.eth, which is a popular Twitter account. It said, a group of DGENs in a sex cult high on amphetamines and living in a $300 million compound in the Bahamas stole $10 billion of customer funds, all to lose it by gambling way on magic internet beams. I think that summarizes the situation for a while. Like, like we uh, I'll subscribe to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, it's bad. Okay, so I think that tweet summarizes the situation pretty well, but let's look at the numbers a little bit more. You just referenced FTX's holdings as of now. They had about $15 billion under custody, or at least that's what they were supposed to have. $5 billion of that was with pulled out of the system uh, throughout the week as there was a bank run. 
and then expose a $10 billion hole in the exchange itself. As of right now, the holdings from its wallets, according to Forecast News, shows that the highest asset they have on their balance sheet is $160 million of FTT, the exchange token, which is basically worthless at this point. The next is USDT, Tether, which is about $100 million. That has been frozen by Tether. And then it follows from there to various stable coins and other tokens that are more or less worthless, including a lot of illiquid shit coins nobody wants. Then looking at the FTX's and Alameda's venture portfolio, we see that they have invested in so many different sectors in the landscape. So DeFi, NFTs, gaming, trading, brokerage, Web3, crypto financial services, infrastructure, data analytics. Uh, you name a company and FTX or Alameda has invested in them to some degree. Of course, we don't really know what this means, right? A lot of times this equity is already going to be locked up. It's going to be frozen. It's going to be liquid because these are just startups. But in other cases, these are tied to other shit coins, other tokens. And that could mean that these tokens are either locked, they're frozen, they're illiquid. This could hurt a lot of those teams. I think the first one that comes to mind is Solana with their SOL token. And it is SOL, right? It is sorry and out of luck. There's not much happening with that token at this point that anyone's enthused about. I think it was trading around $5. A lot of people are saying this is like the Solana team's moment to overcome. We'll see if they can overcome this. They tied their L1 platform to an exchange which was trading illegally in the Bahamas from a sex dungeon. So I don't know if that was quite the right move. Uh, the market's that, certainly betting against Solana, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Huge spot sell-offs on centralized exchanges. And then in the futures market, funding rates are deeply negative. And so everyone's going short. Everyone. Open interest has increased, which means that everyone is piling on their short positions, right? <laughs> Now, people are comparing this to March 2020 when ETH had its $80 moment and rebounded. But it's very different. That was a macro-driven factor. This is completely tied to FTX. And maybe you can say FTX is a macro-driven, but no, they were a giant Ponzi scheme as we're now finding out. As you mentioned, Chapter 11 for FTX, FTX US, Alameda, and a billion different shell corporations that all those entities are tied into. The notable thing here at the FTX US is that previously during this week, Sam Bankman fraud stated that <laughs> they were solvent. FTX US had assets backed one to one. And then the next day, they fired for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So another lie from SBF. Uh, I think two more things out of this we need to touch on is one, BlockFi, and two, the various VC teams that have invested in FTX and Alameda. Uh, Sequoia already wrote off its $150 million allocation to zero. There are a bunch of other notes. You just go through Twitter, you look up FTX, and you put in VC next to those words, and you're going to find a bunch of leaked decks or leaked notes from VC teams saying that, hey, our FTX value is now zero. That's going to put a bad taste in crypto for, for a while in VC circles. And I think it's going to get a lot of these VCs fired. Last thing in this monologue is BlockFi, which we found out last night that BlockFi has with stopped issuing withdrawals from the exchange once again. Uh, FTX, of course, over the summer had its little moment where they came in and tried to bail out BlockFi and backstop it with a $400 million credit line from FTX US. Well, that doesn't really work out when FTX US is in fact Chapter 11. Rough news. I think another knock for BlockFi, I, I didn't think they'd get past the first problem, let alone this. I think it's over for them. But you had some thoughts on BlockFi before we started talking, so I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, my impression of BlockFi, just my own personal speculation, is that there's no way they're going to be able to continue, right? Like their strategy was heavily dependent on sort of the GBTC cash and carry trade, which, as we know, has flipped sort of, you know, deeply uh, discount, um, discount to NAV, that is. Right. And then they sort of pivoted from there and went to ASIC backed loans. And we all know the prices of ASICs have drawn down incredibly in the mining industry. Right. And so I, I don't see how they're going to like crawl out of this hole. Um, and I mean, as what like takeaway for people, like maybe self custody, right? Cause this, this, it's the same thing. You deposit on BlockFi and then. They commingle the client assets and they they use it for lending and trading activities, et cetera, to try to create revenue, right? FTX, it's it was more shadowy. We didn't know that they were doing it. BlockFi was more transparent, but it's the same thing. And we've seen after bear market after bear market, exchanges go bust. Uh, Quadriga X in 20, I think, 18, 19. Mt. Gox of you know, the most fame and those... 
creditors are still trying to fight for their funds, right? This, I think another thing is that this is going to continue to draw out for a long time, Will, that we don't know yet all of the repercussions who all had um, exposure to FTX. You know, I think in the coming days and once we get a more detailed filing, we will really get to understand the scenario and what happened behind the scenes. But these lawsuits where, you know, where people can get paid out can drag on for years and years. I mean, it's been eight years since Mt. Gox and, and, you know, people might get 30 cents on the dollar, right? If, you know, you, you're likely not going to get um, your full funds that you had on the exchange. No, I think it's important to look back at the history of exchange failures, which there has been many, and some of them have worked out of it. So Bitfinex is the one that first comes to mind where they were hacked for a huge amount of Bitcoin. I think it was the largest Bitcoin denominated hack in history. And they actually recently recovered that Bitcoin. Interesting storyline there. But the only reason they got out of that was issuing a Leo token, which is basically an IOU from the exchange. If you ever got that hack of Bitcoin back, you get a percentage of it. And uh, yeah, it solved the issue for them. But like you said, Quadriga, so yeah, that's a huge one. Quadriga you know, it was probably the most well-known to date besides Mt. Gox. And Mt. Gox was so old, I think a lot of people sort of put it back in the annals of Bitcoin history, not necessarily the, uh, the modern exchange infrastructure we have today. And that's what made Quadriga interesting was not only the story of the people going missing and the keys going missing, but it was more of a modern exchange. Now we have an even bigger one with FTX a $15 billion plus hole in the entire industry. Let's zoom out as we close out the podcast and talk about the impacts long-term because I think this is very important to note. We had drawdown in June. And I think that's an important place to look at. Terra, Luna, Celsius, Voyager, and BlockFi in June. All that May and June, that caused devastation for the industry. And I think a lot of people thought that was going to be it. This is even larger than all those and larger than those combined, I think. That was destructive for the industry uh, because a lot of people had exposure to all those companies in some sort of way. But FTX is even larger. Uh, Alameda placed as a central market maker for the entire trading industry. FTX was the third largest exchange in the world. FTX US was quickly becoming one of the most dominant exchanges in the US. Sam bankman fried was on Capitol Hill lobbying for DeFi regulation. All that is gone. All those people have been defrauded. I mean, they're selling their naming rights to the Miami Heat Arena. That was going to that was a joke that that might happen to, because of a bear market, not because of investor fraud. At the same time, we look at some of the numbers. I think you mentioned a second ago the GBTC premium, the discount to NAV there is now at an all time low, of, uh, down negative forty percent. And a lot of people have exposure to that. And we are getting no more regulatory clarity. We're not going to get more regulatory clarity for a little bit because of what's happened here. I think regulators are going to be looking at how they're going to uh, protect investors on exchanges as opposed to issuing a new ETF. I think this potentially sets crypto back longer. We have a much deeper winter than people previously expected. And that's at the same time as the Fed is pro- probably pivoting, right? So like a lot of people thought we might escape this crypto winter a little quickly, a little more quickly, I should say, because of the Fed pivoting. But I think FTX just puts us in a different hole. And you know, Bitcoin's price shows that we're below $17,000 per coin. Yeah, I think that it'll probably get worse before it gets better. But I mean, at the same time, if I'm playing devil's advocate, Maybe exchange failure is sort of completes your bear market bingo card. And, you know, we could sort of are on the road to recovery. Um, We've are like the list of companies that have gone bust. I mean, it's, it's long at this point, right? Celsius, Voyager, 3AC, right? We're going, we just had filings from Core Scientific and Compute North. And we haven't even talked about this is a mining podcast, right? The, the industry-wide revenues for miners, even worse, is hash rate has still at all-time highs, has still climbed, right? And price has just decreased tremendously in the last couple of days. I mean, so your hash price figure is even lower. Miners will continue to be squeezed. We might see a couple more um, bankruptcies there. I think a major sort of implication impact of this um, from like my Western background perspective, is going to be on uh, in regulation and policy. Gensler has already come out and sort of slammed the crypto uh, industry on this. 
there has been for a while kind of a sandbox to play in and some freedom and you know crypto companies can you know work out in the states and and test things out and they're not under you know strict scrutiny and i think that's likely going to change i think you're totally right uh there's going to be regulatory pushes where i'm seeing it where i saw some tweets from elizabeth warren and some from some others we don't know what the fallout's going to look like interestingly enough sbf was a large donor to the biden administration i think the second mm-hmm. or first largest donor to the biden administration and his parents are also well-known uh, advocates for the democratic party so what does that mean we're not quite sure uh there's a there's a lot of split opinions across all parties on crypto right now so we will have to watch that definitely something interesting we'll leave it there for anyone who wants more mining news or updates apologies we did not get to it much this week besides a little bit of exposure from ftx not a lot of ex- lot a lot a bit of exposure luckily uh, but you can definitely go to the compass mining website and check out some of our new articles from anthony power on uh, october mining updates from riot marathon all the others uh, you can also sign up to our mining memo newsletter and get that there as well. One last Matt, point. Go ahead. Go ahead. One last one. This does not affect these sort of fundamentals of these protocols and these cryptocurrencies themselves at all, right? These are centralized financial institutions that are using and interacting with these protocols, right? And so they are sort of disconnected and you know things like Bitcoin continue to operate uh, unaffected, right? But people's reaction will certainly affect the markets. Um, that's my last note. That's what I'm going to leave you with. But I think it's an important reminder. It's a good note for those who are still sticking around listening right now. Matt and I are going to be doing an in-person podcast next week at the Texas Blockchain Council. If you've not gotten tickets to Texas Blockchain Council, you can use code COMPASS20 to get 20% off. It's going to be a good time down in Austin, Texas. If you're there, come say hi to Matt and I. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Maybe you can get some barbecue. But we will see you guys next week, maybe in Texas. Cheers.